All right, our second, second speaker up is Emily Marsh from uh, Linden State College, um, and she'll be talking uh, about the impact of invasive honeysuckle removal on black leg, tick density in an exurban residential setting. Good morning. As he said, I'm Emily Marsh. I'm from Vermont. Linden State College is in the northeast kingdom of Vermont, and I am an undergraduate student there. Um, our study examined the impact of um, invasive honeysuckle removal on um, black legged tick densities in an ex urban setting. Um, Lyme disease is caused by the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi, and it is now found in nearly every state in the United States. Um, it was first discovered in Lyme, Connecticut in 1975, and Lyme is a very difficult disease to diagnose because it is often attributed to other um, health issues. And it has, it can have, if left unchecked, um, negative impacts on um, both physical and neurological. Um, it causes both physical and neurological problems. Um, the vector for Borrelia is Ixodes scapularis, which is the black-legged tick. It's also known as the deer tick to a lot of people. Um, and Hereafter, I will use tick to refer to the black-legged tick because it was the only one in our only species in our study. Um, in Vermont, which is the location of our study, reported cases of Lyme disease increased from 26 in 1999 to 674 in 2013, with a slight decrease last year. Um, these numbers were taken from the Vermont Department of Health. The increase in Lyme is likely due to both an increase in the vector, the black leg tick, um, in our state, as well as an increased um, ability for medical doctors to diagnose the disease correctly. And it doesn't only affect the health of people, but it also um, can increase medical costs due to the nature of the disease. It's a, um, it often has long-term effects that are very debilitating and need constant care. Um, so this increase, it, you know, can cause health care costs to go up in communities around states that have a lot of Lyme. And apparently, I just learned today that Vermont has the highest rate of Lyme. I focus on the ecology of Lyme. Um, it's important to understand uh, ways in which habitat composition affects tick densities. So several studies have um, examined the relationship between tick populations and invasive shrubs, which include things like Japanese knotweed, um, Japanese barberry, and um, invasive honeysuckle shrub species. Um, both the diversity of hosts and changes in abiotic features in the environment can have an effect on tick densities. Um, Elias and others found that um, adult ticks in an invasive shrub environment are 2.3 times higher than in, um, in density than in non-invasive area, shrub areas. And then nymph depth densities in the same study were 1.8 times higher. Um, in another study, um, Allen and others also found that there were, um, there was a higher amount of um, ticks in the invasive shrubs. And our study examined the relationship between tick density and the invasive Lanisera um, tetarica, which is Tetarian honeysuckle. It, it, that's the species, at least in Vermont, that is everywhere. It, and so we removed um, all of the honeysuckle from an area to determine the effect on adult nymph and larval populations. Um, our study was conducted in Colchester, Vermont. 
and which is up north, sort of near Burlington, Vermont. And it's important we find methods to reduce tick populations and therefore reduce Lyme and other tick-borne illnesses such as babesiosis and anaplasma. Um, the co control plot in our study um, contained about 65% cover of honeysuckle and um, invasive honeysuckle shades out native plants as well as using a little pathy to um, prevent their growth. And um, small mammals and deer are um, use the thick understory as protection from predators and that makes an ideal <coughs> questing environment for ticks. And um, invasive honeysuckle is very difficult to eradicate and it's found um, often in urban areas and along hiking trails which brings people into closer contact with the um, ticks favored questing environment. So a study conducted by Smith and Osfeld has shown that tick diversity decreases, uh, um, tick host diversity, excuse me, decreases with an increase in invasive shrub cover. And so they found that when host diversity increased, then it lowered the incidence of infection rates in ticks. And so therefore areas invaded by honeysuckle show, you know, because they show reduced species richness, they are also likely to show an increase in tick infection rates. Um, so we surveyed for ticks in two plots um, using paired transects. And our treatment plot was removed of all honeysuckle and the control was left untouched. Um, our pair transects were located about 10 meters apart, and um, each transect ranged from 11 meters to 50 meters in length, and the varying length of the transects was due to geographical limitations, such as small cliffs or lawn. Um, and the forest composition in the area was mixed northern hardwood. And there were very few native shrub species in either plot at all, and um, it was all Tatarian honeysuckle. Our sampling occurred between September and November of 2013, and between June and November of 2014. So our method of collection was um, using a drag cloth and. It's a one meter squared white cloth and we simply drag it along our transect lines and periodically check the ticks. Um, adults, nymphs, and larvae were all removed from the cloth and stored in ethanol so that they could later be sent for testing. Um, all ticks were collected between temperatures of 10 and 33 degrees Celsius and no surveys were conducted in wet or rain conditions because the ticks hide under the water and you can't really find them. So our results showed that there was a statistically insignificant um, percentage of adults uh, in, in um, between plots. And uh, nymphs showed a significant increase in abundance in the control. Um, and larvae showed the strongest increase in the control. Um, so this graph shows the adults in um, 2013 and 14, and it's kind of even, if you even it out across transects, um, both plots are about the same. Um, and in this graph shows nymphs, and especially on transects 3, 4, and 5, nymphs were much higher in the control. Then um, in larvae, there's a huge increase in tick numbers in the control. And the reason you don't see transects 1 and 6 is because through the entire course of the study, study, I never found one single larvae on either of those transects. 
And because of the nature of larvae, they don't move far from where they emerge, so we left those out. So, the removal of honeysuckle had a negative impact, clearly, on nymphs and larvae. Um, and adults were evenly distributed between the treatment and control. Um, however, in the study by Elias and others, um, adults were also found to be um, higher in, in a um, control, in a shrub area. Um, and so if we remove honeysuckle in areas, we will be able to decrease the vector and therefore decrease lime likely. And our study suggests that removal of honeysuckle can result in fewer larvae that mature over time. And um, honeysuckle patches, however, that are in close proximity to a removal area um, could allow for reintroduction because of adults, the adult's movement. Um, in our study, despite the close proximity of our plots, our treatment and control, the nymphs and larvae were still higher. And this is likely due to the um, difference in adult nymph and larvae dispersals um, because of the host dynamics. So adults take their blood meal from large mammals such as deer and moose, and deer and moose range over a much wider area. And then nymphs take their first blood meal from, or their blood meal, from um, small mammals such as mice and voles. And um, so their range is much smaller. And then larvae simply emerge from eggs and quest extremely close to where they've emerged. Um, so they're, they're located right where they um, begin. And, um, and then they will take their blood meal from small mammals and birds. So the number of ticks that we collected may have been affected by the difference in shrub layer between the control and treatment. Um, the method of dragging can actually be more difficult in dense shrub areas. So in our control plot, we may have picked up less ticks because often my cloth was off the ground. And um, in the treatment, my cloth was almost entirely on the ground the entire time, which would pick up more um, nymphs and, and larvae. But this actually bolsters our study, because we would have found less um, ticks in the control. Um, so um, further study should be done on um, larvae populations. I, I searched and could not find any studies that um, focused primarily on larvae. And then long-term long studies would definitely be beneficial. Um, and in the future, um, if our plots, if our control plot was removed at honey, of honeysuckle, we, we may see a large reduction in adults and, and larger reduction in nymphs as well. Um, and, and, and I just found out I am able to continue the study, so we may, we may have results for that in the future. So fully understanding the habitat preferences of black-legged ticks would be beneficial in understanding um, how to prevent unnecessary exposure to ticks and therefore Lyme disease. And um, I would like to thank the Colchester landowner who paid for the removal of the honeysuckle and allowed us to use her property. She wished to remain anonymous, but we, and. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, the co-author, since he's not here, for um, getting me interested in this study. And any questions? Have you considered a treatment where you remove the small mammals and then the sample? We are. We actually have three studies going on right now. Um, I, I'm an undergraduate and just got fo focused on the like, kind of simpler <laughs> study, but um, my professor is looking at small mammal populations, and um, you, we actually pick larvae off their ears, and, and um, so that study has not been completed.
yet. It's just kind of in the starting stages. So. I was curious if you had uh, thought about having another plot where you remove um, native shrubs, so similar um, type of vegetative structure, to see if it was just the vegetation or if it was really the invasive. Well, the um, so if you remove all shrubs, that's going to have a bigger impact than just removing invasives. Um, however, both the studies that I mentioned, I, I'm not sure, the Allen study I'm not sure about, but I know two studies that I looked at meant, did um, look at the difference between native and invasive shrubs, and they were higher every time in invasive shrub. And that's likely due to the kind of monoculture that invasives um, um, Janice Kyle of the North American Native Plant Society from Toronto, and I had Lyme disease a few years ago, and um, and they have just recently in our province of Ontario, in northern Ontario, found evidence of the Borrelia burgdorferi, so it's moving widely into Canada. Yes, it's and, moving. And one yeah. of the issues that we're finding that I'm most um, interested in as someone who has had this terrible disease. Um, is that they are anticipating in the city of Toronto that 80% of the city is going to be affected by Lyme disease by 2020. And so we'd like to kind of take a preventative approach as a native um, plant organization because there's already some fear and paranoia um, that if you, for example, have native habitat, that that is going to increase, right, the rate of Borrelia and the presence of Lyme. And thus, I would just really like to support um, your study and to say, I think we really need, on both sides of the border, to have more research studies done to counteract the paranoia and the fear, the terror that's going to happen in the next few years, both in Canada and probably here in the United States as well. So I just want to commend you on your study and to say if anyone knows of any other studies that are be being done, um, you know, research, empirical research, I think we really you know, all together we need to gather that together um, to be able to kind of counteract the opposition that is going to be coming in the future against native plants and, and uh, native habitat. For in Vermont, there's already paranoia. People aren't sending their kids outside, which mm -hmm. is, if you check, I mean, if you're just religious about checking yourself for ticks, you can, but um, I can, after the talks, I can give you my professor's um, information because he really is the tick guy. I I did this study more because I, I'm into plants and he said, well, there's honeysuckle involved. <laughs> so, and I'm an undergraduate, I don't have as much control over what I do. So, um, so, but I can give you that. Thank you very much. So much. A couple quick questions. I, I wasn't familiar with the uh, sampling technique. I assume you're getting them on your person as well. Did they go into well, the vials or was it just on the cloth? Um, so when I first started, I wore just my regular clothes, white clothes, but they were normal. And I got them all over me. I had to pick them off all the time. It was gross. And, <laughs> Did they go into the, sam and, the sample? Was that part of your sampling or just what No, was no, that's off transect. Okay. We okay. still use those ticks, but for something else. That's off transect. It does not count. Um, however, I a few weeks into our study in the first year, I got clothes that are infused with permethrin, so I have my choice between Lyme and Parkinson's. And <laughs> so, um, and they, the females will totally crawl on the permethrin clothes. They're hardcore, and they, they just, you know, I've had tons of them crawling up, and I just pick them off, put them in my vials. Um, the, I've never seen a nymph larvae at all on my clothes, and I think maybe one male. Like, they do not like the permethrin. And the females, even after a time, will drop off. But you gotta, you can't wash your clothes very often because then it reduces the effectiveness. But. And uh, my second quick one is how did you remove the honeysuckle? What was your method? For I didn't. I, um, they, I think they just hacked it down and put Roundup on it. It was some company that the landowner hired right before we started our study. And ideally, we would have liked that, to have sampled that before she removed it, but we were unaware that she was going to remove it at that date, so we didn't get a prior sample, unfortunately. I live on Martha's Vineyard, and the tick epidemic there is incredible. I mean, I've probably had 50 that I've pulled off in the last 12 years, and I've done Lyme treatments. Uh, also, part of this has to be the reduction in fear. There's 50 per square mile on the vineyard, 
And what you see is, I mean, we're out there doing the floor, we're actually caging plants for us to work. It's on our overbrows. So it's a combination of you know, invasives, uh, disturbance, minimizing disturbance, but also reducing the ear curve. So just, that's insane amount of fear that we have. <coughs> it, um, it's controversial, but it's true. <laughs> it's actually, I mean, the deer do move ticks around, but it is usually when people get Lyme, it's from the nymphs because they're harder to find, and nymphs take their blood meals from small mammals. So we're finding that small mammals are at least as, if not more important in the transmission of both Lyme and tick movement than, um, than deer. And um, at least in Vermont, I can't speak for, you know, the areas I don't know, but in Vermont it's definitely, you know, nymphs are more, and, and most people get Lyme from nymphs, um, from what I've read. But yes, like, there is an overpopulation of deer on those areas. Okay, well, thanks, Emily.